Um, thanks very much. I, I, we open now the, the question and answer discussion session and uh, maybe just to kick off, um, I will take uh, a question first. It's in fact one that, uh, that has come from the, from the, uh, the chat um, um, box. And uh, it's, um, uh, maybe I pose a question to, to, to Diderik in, in Brussels. Uh, about the, uh, the circular economy. And uh, of course, we heard examples from companies here uh, of uh, um, attempts to bring the circular economy ideas to, uh, into their um, um, production uh, systems. Um, how is, uh, is the Green Deal going to take this notion of the circular economy further, uh, in, particularly in the, in the industry sector in, in Europe? In, in business, also the services, of course. Uh, what are you going to put on the on the table? Is it um, a legislation push, uh, or is it a market pull that you're creating um, uh, with the Green Deal? Um, or uh, and also circular economies, of course, are often global. Um, how does this impact, uh, for instance, the trade relations with uh, a country like Indonesia, with whom we are? negotiating a free trade agreement. Um, well, thank you very much for that question. Yeah, the circular economy is one of the um, main um, building blocks of the Green Deal. Um, and we have, uh, just before COVID um, entered our world, uh, we had produced the circular economy action plan with one flagship legislative proposal in there, which is called the sustainable products policy. Um, and it, it's a long word for just uh, saying that we are going to prescribe the way we produce and consume uh, our products. And that's nothing new, obviously. We, all, we, we do that for ages. If I raise one product of, out of this table here that I have in front of me, let's take this, this uh, iPhone. There's a CE logo on the back, which means uh, the iPhone complies with, with regulations that the European Union has set. Um, the regulation here in this case is that it doesn't set itself on fire and doesn't self-explode, which is not that very ambitious. Uh, but we could, we could go one step beyond that, or two steps, or even more than that, and prescribe the circularity of such products. And we will do that. Uh, we have an eco-design directive already on the table, which concentrates mainly on the energy use of certain, uh, certain products, like televisions, refrigerators, vacuum cleaners, etc. We can extend that to also other aspects of that same product, the circularity. What kind of materials are we making? Are the, um, are the products repairable? Which is not irrelevant if you look at this iPhone where you cannot take the battery out. You have to throw it away when that's gone. So um, yes, we are making a big push on this. Uh, at the same time, we're also obviously trying to, to create a market pool. For our external policies, um, it can mean a lot in both, uh, if you look, for, uh, look at it from the threats uh, side, obviously if we impose standards for our own products, we are going to impose those same standards for products that we import. Uh, but at the same time, a circular economy needs new materials, other materials, more, much more bio-based materials instead of the old fashioned um, oil-based plastics. And that's where the opportunities are. If we really want to move to a circular economy and create circular products, also circular building materials, uh, we were discussing the renovation wave earlier on, and it will inevitably mean a shift from fossil fuel-based uh, materials towards bio-based materials. And that's obviously where huge opportunities are because we all know that Europe cannot provide for its own biomass. Uh, we need to import that. It's a challenge uh, in the sustainability to, to import those products in a sustainable way, but it's also an opportunity there to work together with the rest of the world, especially with a country like Indonesia. Great, thanks. Um, I, I invite the other panelists also to come in, but um, yeah. in the meantime, I, um, I I carry on with uh, some uh, some of the other questions that I've got, and um, 
particularly the, the impact of the, the Green Deal on foreign trade of the EU. Uh, what, what do you think will change? The EU has, you know, traditionally, of course, emphasized notions of sustainable development and, and so on in its uh, trade agreements. Um, is there anything going to change, you think, in the, in the, in the, in the future? Are we, um, uh, can importers into the EU uh, expect uh, higher standards in this or that area as regards carbon content and, and, and the like? Well, yes, they can. Uh, uh, unfortunately, or I would say fortunately, they can, because it, it also will mean a much more mature relationship with the rest of the world. Um, uh, Europe should get off its moral high ground and uh, work uh, with the rest of the world as if the rest of the world are adults. And I think that would be justified because the rest of the world are mature, uh, sometimes even more than we are. Um, but it also means um, a more equal relationship in terms of uh, the product standards that we do apply. Yeah, um, I do see um, opportunities there, but as I said earlier, it's so far and I'm not uh, tone deaf for the situation, for instance, with Indonesia, where, for instance, the red directive uh, with the uh, new requirements for palm oil products uh, led to some animosity there. Uh, that's logic that's uh, well in every good relationship you have those uh, but we need to use those uh, struggles to make ourselves better and as I said earlier I mean there's going to be huge energy related relationships uh, with the rest of the world uh, we cannot provide in our own energy as, and uh, that will be the reality for at least the next three or four decades uh, so we need to import it and at the moment it's Saudi Arabia and Kuwait who provide the oil and Russia by the way um, uh, but if we move towards much more sustainable fuels um, there's other countries that uh, that could take the lead in that provided that Indonesia and uh, I was uh, enlightened and inspired by the presentations I just saw that Indonesia jumps two steps forward too in terms of real sustainable fuels and uh, as I said, um, diverts from just providing the raw material towards providing the real end products using the technology that we can together develop. Great. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks very much. I got a question from for uh, Ibu Shinta. Um, but I think it's um, other panelists can can reply it's, um, uh, to it as well, uh, including Diederik from the European perspective. Is the question is, do you think um, um, that um, it is possible that the COVID um, post COVID economic recovery uh, could move away uh, from uh, subsidies for fossil fuels? in Indonesia towards more subsidies for investing in renewable energy. Uh, so it's an Indonesia orientated question, but I'm sure that uh, from the European end, we have, have a, a view on that as well. So we can have a view from the side of the Diederik. Ibo. Audio. Thank you, Vincent. Thank you and thank you for the questions. Actually, I, I wish uh, my government is sitting here in the panel because this is exactly what we have been trying to do with our government. Because, um, you know, subsidized fossil fuel will just never work for renewable, right? We can never compete. So mm -hmm. that's why, um, actually, we have been trying to push this. And um, unfortunately, uh, it's, there have not been any positive results so far. But I think uh, I have to say the new um, uh, energy minister seems to be uh, very much pro renewable. This is what he mentioned, and he's trying, I think, to really look into uh, um, really capturing more renewable energy projects. But I have to come to say that when we talk about um, renewable <coughs> energy, I mean, of course, there are. It's not just about the technology. 
Okay, the technology, I think, uh, it can be bad. But it's more, uh, we know about the, the cost. So one thing, one aspect is the cost. But um, the second aspect is also the community support. And this is why I said education and awareness is very important. Now, I could just give you a very quick example because we are doing currently a geothermal project that the community just doesn't understand that, you knew, that geothermal is clean. Because they, in their mind, you know, oh, this is this is going to be uh, impact like uh, you know uh, a very bad, you know, it will create a very bad environment uh, um, impact for the community and so forth. So, I think for us, this is why I always mention also we have to look at also the the community, the consumer because there's still a lot of education and awareness projects. So one aspect is from the government policy. <clears throat> From the funding, but also um, uh, the the market itself, which is the community itself, needs to understand. And this is really basic. We're talking about geothermal, which is technology has is there, but we're talking about community that are in a lower level that they just don't understand yet what is geothermal and you know why is geothermal uh, cleaner and so. Forth. So, um, going back to the question, yes, we are uh, still pushing our government whether COVID. In a way, uh, post COVID, this will happen because COVID will impact. Mm, it's it's hard to say at this moment. Uh, I think a, a, a lot of uh, uh, priority agenda within the government. So I can't say that this uh, will happen. But definitely, we are not giving up and <laughs> we're pursuing this. Thank you. Yeah, if I can add a little bit, Ibu Sinta. So this is just from the perspective of the industry, and also from the Eurogen. On the re renewable energy, so you see in my presentation, uh, we as a Danone, for example, as a company, we have the ambition to be 100% renewable energy by 2030. But the thing is that we have such both ambition in Indonesia, where, you know, still the access on the renewable is very limited, and also the policy is not really, you know, supporting the access of the renewable energy. But this is more towards our commitment that, okay, we have uh, to do, this is something the right way to do. This is the reason why we are trying to do our best to have access for renewable energy, even though sometimes, and we also have been experiencing uh, where, even though we expect to have kind of a incentive for the government because it is supporting the green energy initiative, but in, uh, in, in opposite that actually we have to pay some tariff, which is, we are working together, for example, like with Eurogem to do the advocacy and then now we got, even though it is not the best one, but now we get uh, some uh, kind of a, a better option from the government, government. But still, I think it is quite a long way to go Then we need to engage with the government. We need to partner with them uh, to give kind of a the right perspective so that the renewable energy for Indonesia, it will be, you know, uh, scaling up. And also there are more and more industry can also access for the renewable energy with a, with a better scheme, I would say. Um, uh, Eric, would you want to comment from the European perspective? perspective? Yes, this is, um, uh, well, as the, um, the speakers before me said, uh, it's a real tangible um, uh, issue uh, that comes back in every discussion about uh, sustainability. What about the, the, the subs subsidies to the fossil fuel world and the fossil fuel economy? Uh, the commitments are fine uh, on the EU level. Um, I'm not objective, but I can say that uh, the the, the the commitments to get rid of fossil fuel subsidies are uh, plenty. Um, the reality is much more uh, complicated, uh, and COVID will add to that complication um, because uh, no matter what the, the the logic of a green recovery is uh, rationally. Um, the, the reflex of, of normal people, li like we all are, by the way, uh, to pick up the pieces where you left them before COVID are, are huge. Uh, everybody wants to start driving like they drove, flying like they flew, and ha operating the factories like they operated just before they were uh, shut down because of COVID-19. And, and that reflex is even strengthened by government state aid, um, which will we, which we are, will have to pay close attention to to see that uh, it, the state aid that is sometimes really needed to, to keep companies afloat is not indirectly or even directly subsidizing getting back to the old world. 
so this this is a this is where the real issue is. The policies might be fine, the financing will be there or not, but well, let's see what happens in the coming weeks. Uh, but then the reality kicks in, uh, and that's where I'm not naive. I know that uh, policymakers uh, do tend to uh, pay less attention to the implementation of their own policies than to the creation of their own policies. Uh, but in this time the energy should go and the attention should go to the implementation of everything because that, that's, it, that's where the real issues are. Thank you. I've got here one very brief question and I will just put it uh, to the panel um, uh, as it is. And I think it's, there's maybe, um, it's particularly directed, I think, to, uh, to Diederik. And uh, the question says, this is a question from Berlin. Uh, so um, the question is, how will the Green Deal stop deforestation in Indonesia? Diederik, <laughs> uh, what, what, uh, what can you say in, in reply to that uh, very short, short question? You can maybe <laughs> well, elaborate also. Uh, yeah in short it will not uh because uh let's let's be honest the world is bigger than europe and indonesia's trading partners are more diverse than just just the eu um so uh, deforestation will have to be stopped by indonesia itself by the way and in cooperation with all its trading partners of which the eu is one so we can contribute to this to solving this problem and we will uh we have actually have clear uh, proposals um, to well first start labeling our products uh, much more transparently and also um, more uh, in a clearer way for consumers to start labeling products and actually start with forestation products so wood and, and wood products um, in order to inform our consumers on what's happened actually when making this product, uh, what's happened somewhere else in the world that hardly anybody can see. Um, and obviously a next step would be to put uh, mandatory conditions towards those products in order to be uh, able, eligible for import in the EU. But that's a conversation we, we need to, to, to have in the coming years. But we are committed to, make, to have that conversation. Uh, we already have the plan uh, to, to translate that into labeling of, of wood products so that consumers can see what actually what the difference is between sustainable products and non-sustainable products and the step beyond that is obviously to get rid of the non-sustainable products. Thanks. Um, next question um, is um is about plastic. Uh, now, this is a question that will certainly interest uh, Danone. Uh, um, the, 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 uh, the question is, uh, I'm interested to hear more about the EU's green policy on plastic use, on extended corporate responsibility towards plastic, and about uh, the uh, development of the legal framework uh, for this. Now, it's a question about EU policy, uh, but we can uh, also convert this into a question about um, uh, the, uh, the reality uh, in, in Indonesia. So both uh, uh, Shinta and Karianto, please feel free to come in. Uh, but do you what's going on? I don't know, Dederik, okay. whether you want to, to first uh, put on the EU policy. Uh, otherwise, I, I will give uh, my uh, perspective first, and then perhaps you can add with some more related to EU policy. But basically, related to this uh, plastic topic, uh, I, I think the Indonesian government has already quite have uh, quite, you know, have some in, in some intensive uh, discussion with the uh, EU uh, countries. There are several dialogue, uh, several conversation around the plastic topic, and then. Uh, just recently, Indonesia launched uh, what we call it the NPAP uh, National uh, Plan for for na National Plan for uh, a, a National Action Plan for Plastic. So, which is uh, with this uh, with this uh, pledge or with this new commitment, basically Indonesia is really committed to reduce the marine plastic pollution by 
70 percent uh, 2025 and then to be uh, nearly zero by 2040 and of course if, we, if this is quite ambitious target if, if we are talking about nearly zero by 2020 there will be uh, no longer business as usual this is what government mentioned in this uh, in this uh, uh, plans which is fo basically focusing on the five element which is on the in innovation part on the financing on the metrics on the uh, consumer behaviors and then also uh, the area that linked to the, the the policy definitely so it's quite a big ambition uh, which is uh, for example within the npap there was a kind of a, a target to to reduce the use of uh, plastic virgin plastic by 1 million ton per year by up to 2025 to double the use of recycling materials by 2025. I think this is also, also to step up really on the waste collection because the waste collection is really the issue in Indonesia. So therefore, uh, this is something that uh, is happening in, in Indonesia. And then uh, the government also already put kind of a roadmap on the packaging, uh, packaging roadmap, uh, which is by 2030, there are several elements that has to be further comply with the industry. But of course, in this case, we need to have a further dialogue uh, together with the government to ensure that we really put the right context. Because uh, of course, uh, Indonesia with the 17,000 island, you know, with a huge country, it is different mm -hmm. with the Europe. Of course, we cannot just adopt the policy from Europe, but we can, you know, we can adopt with some adjustment, which is very relevant to the Indonesia context. I give you an example, what is the, the, the local context. I mean, if you talk about the Indonesia collections, now the, based on the latest study, the collection rate of plastic is 10%. So it means that 90% is still leakage either to the landfill or to the environment. So, however, actually there are several type of material which is the collection rate is high. For example, on the PET, it's 60%, 62%. Why it is higher? Because it has value, it is recyclable, so that we can convert, we can do recycling either into the new new PET bottle or other type of product. And then also, who is really involved in this kind of a circular economy model in Indonesia? So far, it is mostly informal sector because the infrastructure is not there yet. I mean, the, the law enforcement is not there. The waste management, which is supposed to be the local government to really push on the waste management, but it's not really investing. There is no really political will from the local government. So informal sector play very important role. So therefore, if you want to push, for example, on the uh, extended producer responsibility, then we have also to consider how we address the informal sector. How we, we also uh, build kind of an inclusive model to help and to support informal sector uh, as part of the overall circular economy. So I think, uh, I think go back to the, the policy. Uh, your government is not here, but I would say that quite uh, intensive discussion uh, between government and also uh, Indonesia and also EU. And of course, we as an industry as well, uh, either to Eurocham or to PRIS or to individual company, we need to really work together with the government to have kind of, a, uh, I would say the win-win model for addressing the plastic especially plastic issue in Indonesia. Thanks. Um, Diederik, uh, treat, how did, does the Green Deal approach the plastic question? Well, we already started before the Green Deal with uh, banning single-use plastics for certain types uh, and we were planning and we are still committed to continuing with that, uh, including uh, the use of uh, much more recycled plastic, uh, including, uh, as I said, replacements of plastics with bio-based materials. All those policies are in place and we're pretty ramped up in, in the context of the Green Deal. Uh, here's where COVID reality kicks in too, because it, no doubt uh, it will lead to a lot more uh, use of uh, single-use plastics uh, out of hygiene reasons um, and um, that is a challenge that we now have to face um, uh, yeah. it's a reality nobody asked for but it's there and we need to uh, we need to face that and we not, we might instead of lowering the ambition we need to ramp up our investments and our, our 
our, our efforts to uh, increase the, the recycling of plastic and uh, to decrease the use of, of, of virgin plastic, even in this new reality. There's obviously also a very uh, tangible uh, part of this plastic strategy uh, in relation to countries like Indonesia, but also Malaysia, China, and that's the waste. Uh, the shipment of waste, the export of it uh, towards countries like Malaysia, Indonesia and others. And I would encourage uh, Indonesia to be much more vi vigilant on this one. Uh, like China, like others, um, in a mature relationship, it doesn't fit that one uh, continent dumps its waste on the other. Uh, so we need to get ourselves, we need to get a, a grip on that. Um, and Europe needs to take care of its own waste uh, in, a, in an appropriate manner. Um, and we shouldn't use the, the cheap channels to get rid of it. Um, I just want to add a little bit, uh, if you don't mind, Vincent. Um, sure. I think this is very key uh, at the moment, uh, considering, I mean, I, I'm, I'm working right now um, in many aspects during COVID. I can see that the use of plastics is significantly now more than ever. So I think uh, I agree with uh, Dedrick. So we have, especially Indonesia, we have to be very careful that this agenda that we have put forward, I think the, the working group has started actually um, uh, what was mentioned before by Tarianto. Uh, I mean, I really hope uh, this is still going to be uh, in a forefront agenda of the government post COVID. Because I can see that um, at the moment, this is definitely not in their mind, right? This is definitely not in their So we need to ensure that a lot of these things that we have worked for uh, prior to COVID will be continue um, to be supported uh, by the government. And I think this is our, some of the, the thing that we have to really monitor post-COVID. And when is that going to be? I think that's really the question. When is that post-COVID that we can really restart a lot of this effort that we have done? Thanks. Um, good. Um, I, I, this is a question, I, I don't know where it is from, I think from Indonesia. Um, I think directed to, uh, uh, to Diedrich Samsung. And as Mr. Samson is saying, there will be new specific standards um, uh, to support the circular economy and circular products. Um, this could mean a burden uh, for uh, a country like Indonesia, uh, which has to produce and um, export products meeting EU standards. And the question is, is any, any financial um, uh, assistance uh, provided for, for, for this? Uh, now, the financial question is one thing, but this, the other is, how, how does the, uh, the, the Green Deal uh, see this interface, this interaction with um, you know, the Europe, the highly developed um, uh, European economy and others, of course, um, with emerging economies, fast growing economies, but still developing uh, like, like Indonesia. Um, yes, that, uh, it's clear that this, um, the Green Deal will lead to higher standards also for the rest of the world. As I said, um, we take a, a sort of a more assertive approach towards this issue uh, in terms of uh, raising the level playing, raising the playing field for everyone. And that is, that requires another relationship. As I said earlier, it requires a more mature relationship because I do not only see threats there, I also see loads of opportunities for new investments in order to make those products complying with European standards. Um, and Europe is not the only one setting better standards now. And it's also happening in China, uh, one of the other export markets of Indonesia. And I think that there is... Uh, so there's a general tendency, uh, luckily, towards higher standards. And there's an obligation for every country and every company to invest in the new technology needed to meet those, those, uh, those standards. And obviously, in the relationship that we have with the rest of the world, not only with Indonesia, as I said, this requires more engagement, not less. It might require money, but it will also require 
technical assistance or direct foreign direct investments. Um, I know a lot of companies here that uh, see opportunities in, in Indonesia to invest in those, that technology to meet the standards for the European market. And I actually also know a lot of Indonesian companies that can do the same. So here we are in a more mature, equal relationship <laughs> towards a sustainable world. And I think that's actually the, the, the pathway we should go and we should actually accelerate on that pathway instead of slowing down out of fear of, uh, well, higher standards uh, and, uh, that we might not be able to meet. Thanks. Ibushinta, what, what does your Cadin membership need in terms of assistance or can they do the job of upgrading Yes, um, I think we need to understand that majority of Indonesian businesses, 97% are small, medium enterprises, right? I think we are mm -hmm. very clear. These are definitely the ones that are not able to really follow the standard. So um, the bigger companies, of course, uh, that have significant export, yes, they have been, uh, you know, doing this, trying to follow the standard. But um, uh, we need to think, rethink definitely um, SME because they, they, they need to be participate. I mean, we are now um, uh, boosting for more export from our, for our, from our SMEs as well. And even the, um, you know, when we talk about more um, cooperation, we are no longer talking about just the big businesses. We're talking about, you know, the medium sized companies who are looking for really uh, new technology, working together with, with uh, European companies and so forth. So I think um, the key is who, right? I mean, I, I understand they direct that, yes, Indonesian companies may be capable, but uh, what Indonesian companies? Because I think this is where a lot of our SMEs is, is lagging at the moment. And uh, because government is trying to facilitate, the big, big businesses are also trying to facilitate, um, you know, uh, putting them as, as, as a part of the supply chain. They are also working with the smallholders. They're talking with, uh, um, more with the SMEs to, to really facilitate. But again, uh, this is a bigger effort. You know, this, this can't be done on uh, one-on-one -on -one basis. So I think this is where a government needs to be present as well. And um, I, don't, I wanna go back again to reiterate how important it is for us that having uh, the trade agreement such as the uh, EU CEPA with, with the EU to address some of these issues, you know, standards, you know, the capacity building, how we can be supported more on that level and so on. So not really financial directly, but really the, the support, the technical assistance to be able to fulfill uh, those standards. Great, thanks. Um, look at the clock, it's uh, 1627 in Jakarta, 1127 in Brussels. Uh, so we need to start winding up. And, uh, uh, but I will put a, um, give all three panelists um, uh, in reverse order from how they started uh, the chance for a, a last message. Um, before we pass the, uh, the floor to Corinne, uh, Corinne Tapp, uh, President of Eurocham, for her concluding remarks. And so I would like to invite uh, um, Ibu Shinta, uh, Carianto, and, and Diederik, you know, you know, what is for you, in, in a few words, the key thing you would like uh, to achieve uh, in terms of the partnership between Indonesia and uh, the European Union for getting traction, uh, for boosting traction on the uh, on the green agenda. Uh, we call it Green Deal in Europe. Okay, that's our uh, policy, but here there's also a green agenda. And how can we make the two meet uh, at governmental level and uh, at a business level? Yes. Uh, thank you, Vincent. So I start. So I think. Uh, I have to say that one way or the other, we have to include the green agenda into uh, the government post-COVID uh, reform policy. So I think um, this is both on the government level as well as the business level. I mean, it's, it's important that COVID cannot be the excuse for putting this agenda behind. COVID should be the excuse for putting this agenda forward. 
So I think this is very, very important that um, we can uh, really uh, use this as uh, actually as a momentum while business are transforming, while government are relooking looking what's the new normal, that this agenda should be put <coughs> in place. And this is why I, I specifically mentioned to our um, state planning agency, who's also working on the planning uh, of um, the government, that uh, somehow he needs to ensure that the other ministries are on the same path of going towards this. And specifically with EU, I think there are many, many uh, opportunities we can already uh, see. But what we need to prepare ourselves is more, um, don't look at today, because today seems to be very gloom. No nothing is, is moving, not even our negotiation is moving, right? But I think how, do, what, how can we be more ambitious afterwards? What, what we need to prepare that there is a world uh, uh, after COVID, uh, when we are rebooting, that this is um, the green deal, the green economy should be a priority for us. That's uh, my last thing. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Ibushinta, for that very, very clear message uh, coming from, uh, from the Chamber of Commerce in Indonesia. Um, Corianto, uh, from yep. the uh, from your sites, from the known and from your channel. Yeah, uh, basically a few things. The first one is that, I mean, the climate change is a global issue. It is not, it is not a European issue, but of course this is also in, in the <coughs> Indonesia issue. It is really cross-boundary issue where we really have to address uh, together. <clears throat> and the impact to climate change, I think it is very obvious. Uh, even though in Indonesia we are really affecting also with the climate change uh, impact to the water scarcity, agriculture, farming, flood, uh, etc. and so forth. So therefore, uh, we need to address this together. It is not only government, but also from, from the industry side, because I think for the industry, for the industry we have to see, have to see. Uh, it is kind of a license to operate, because we need to really see this uh, in the future, there will be lack of resources if we don't change our business model, if we don't change the new economic models, and then how business we see this as an opportunity, how to be able to, to win also the heart of the consumers by, by pushing and promoting more green product, then how to embrace the entire citizens. I think this is something, the opportunity that we see to further grow our business in the future. And then as for, you know, COVID, you know, we believe and we, we see ourselves that there's a lot of uh, behavior change for our consumers. The behavior change, change in terms of the way they consume a product, they, they concern more to the health, and then now they are focusing more to the affordability, the environment impact is really, you know, uh, we discussed before on, on waste, for example. But this is, we have to see this also in an opportunity as mentioned by Dusinta that we have to further push, you know, the topic on climate, the topic on environmental sustainability further. Then let's, let's take the momentum post-COVID to push further together. Thank you. Great, thank you, thank you. A very uh, um, uh, similar message, I think, um, with a similar orientation as the one of uh, Ibu Shinta. So it seems that Indonesian and European businesses are on the same wavelength. Great. <laughs> um, and lastly, uh, Diederik uh, from the European Commission, uh, Diederik Samson, your, your key message to, to the audience today, please. Well, I think um, the word engagement is, uh, is my key message uh, for now because, uh, well, We've seen what COVID can do in a world that is very connected. Uh, it can spread like a fire. Uh, but at the same time, we at the moment experience what we can do in a world that is connected. I'm talking from a building in Brussels to uh, you in Indonesia and people from all over the world are listening in. So that's what we also can do. And we can engage with each other to make uh, out of this enormous crisis that I reiterate, we've only seen the beginning of it at the moment. Uh, but we can make something good out of this if we work together. Um, the, the Green Deal is the basis for that. The context has changed completely. 
we need to take that context into account we need but not to lower the ambition but actually to increase the ambition and moreover to increase increase the cooperation because there's only one way we can do this and that's together that will be my key message to you thanks very much indeed uh Diederik, um, head of cabinet uh, of the executive vice president of the european commission uh, for that um Corinne Tapp, uh, please president of your uh, your your concluding remarks uh, Thank you, uh, Vincent, and uh, it's great to, uh, to be here with everybody in this uh, fantastic event. It has been a very special week, clearly, for the EU and for Eurocham, with uh, your day being the, the 9th of May, and uh, actually the 11th of May we celebrated the 16th anniversary of Eurocham in Indonesia. And therefore today is a great opportunity to celebrate this with this excellent webinar, with uh, a fantastic lineup of uh, diverse speakers, uh, Mr. Diederik Samson from Brussels, it was a real pleasure to have you uh, here. Um, my colleague uh, in both Eurocham and in Danone, Pakarianto, also fantastic of you to share, let's say, the progress we're making as European businesses supporting the Indonesian government. And of course, a friend and key stakeholder, Ibu Shinta from, from Kadim, as one of our key stakeholders in this uh, supporting the Indonesian government to, uh, to progress. And thank you, Mr. Um, Ambassador Vincent for hosting this meeting and, um, and animating this. Uh, it's been a fantastic event. It's clear that both the EU and Eurocham share um, a conviction um, in the essentiality of sustainability and the Green Deal for Indonesia's long-term growth and progress for both people and planet. We have fortunately seen pre-COVID uh, a visible increase in the awareness in green and circular economy aspects, as well as a strong commitment of the government of Indonesia, which was referred to by uh, many of the speakers. Uh, and for example, the commitment to reduce marine waste by 70% in 2025, but also clear support um, for growth and circular, uh, circular, economy, uh, circular economy models like uh, Danone is implementing. But we also know that policy adjustments are needed to support acceleration of a greener Indonesia. And also more incentive schemes have to be put in place to support better behaviors of the large and the small and medium companies. Funding and investment remains a challenge for most companies in Indonesia, and this could be even more challenging post-COVID. But I am confident that part of the new normal that we will face will include a renewed awareness and interest of the value of operating in a sustainable manner. And Eurocham has a huge role to play here together with Kadim. Adjusting and adapting to a green and circular economy will for sure benefit all stakeholders concerned, as well as the future generations to come. And it will be crucial in Indonesia's post-COVID recovery, and this together with the EU Indonesia SEPA will be key to speed up the recovery after COVID. As one of the largest populated countries in the world, with its fair share of challenges, as we know, around, for example, access to water, waste management, green energy, we know also that the key path forward will be to provide solutions that create value in a socially inclusive way. And we cannot just copy things that work in some other countries. We need to understand the context and make sure that this works in a context and that we engage the full value chain through a true circular, circular economy model. But the opportunities are there and I believe now is the time to strategize and to make a difference and support Indonesia to accelerate in this area while supporting the recovery of its economy. Thank you very much. Great, thank you very much, uh, Corinne Tapp, uh, President Eurocham, for your concluding remarks. Uh, I couldn't say it better. And um, I uh, simply now wish to close this uh, webinar uh, by thanking uh, all um, uh, contributors, Diederik Samson from the European Commission in Brussels, uh, Ivo Shinta Kamdani uh, from Kadin, and uh, Pakarianto Vibovo uh, from um, uh, Danone, Indonesia, and Eurocham. Uh, thank you very much for your contributions. We will continue on this path. We will continue to make, uh, uh, build the green agenda uh, through business to business engagement um, in Indonesia. Uh, besides, of course, the engagement uh, that EU will wish to uh, develop uh, at governmental level. By the way, just for everybody to know, there are a number of representatives of the uh, 
government of Indonesia present uh, in the audience and uh, uh, I hope this can be a basis for taking our dialogue to the next step. Thank you very much uh, to everybody. I wish you well. Uh, stay safe and uh, greetings from our home to your homes. Thank you.